Good morning, dear colleagues. Today we have extraordinary opportunity to welcome here in Prague and here at Czech Technical University a very well-known astronomer, laureate of Nobel Prize for Physics, Professor uh, Robert Woodrow Wilson. Professor Wilson, welcome here in Prague and we are very glad that you are sharing with us the time and place here and that you will tell us about the last glimpse of the origin of this universe in, in your lecture and tomorrow in the colloquium and other occasions during your uh, two days visit. Professor Wilson uh, is, a, as I said, well-known astronomer, American astronomer who won in 1978 Nobel Prize for Physics together with Arno Alan Penzias due to the discovery of the cosmic microwave background um, back in 1964. He was awarded also with, uh, at the time with other scientists, Piotr Kapica, but for unrelated works. While working on the new prototype of uh, antenna at Bell Labs um, in Homedale Township, New Jersey, they found a source of noise um, in the atmosphere which was not known origin and none of the earthly origins were um, able to explain it. And later on, of course, it was discovered that this is uh, the cosmic microwave background. And uh, this is one of the very important supporting pillars of the Big Bang theory, of course. Uh, Professor Wilson was born on January 10th, 1936 uh, in Houston, Texas. And he graduated from Lamar High School in River Oaks in Houston. And then he studied undergraduate uh, studies at Rice University also in Houston and uh, later he was uh, studying uh, at Caltech, at California Institute of Technology. And uh, since then, uh, Professor Wilson remained in, at Bell Laboratories until uh, 1994, when he was named a senior scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he remains until today. So, um, I hope this is uh, a brief introduction for Professor Wilson, and I would like to give a uh, uh, word to the representative of the Honeywell uh, company, who, uh, which, which brought us, um, Professor Wilson, here to Prague. Thank you, Vice Rector, university students and faculty and frames from the community and media. It's my pleasure to introduce one of the Honeywell's primary program in science, technology, engineering and math, Honeywell Initiative for Science and Engineering. I'm pleased to say this is the fourth time we are bringing our Nobel laureate program to this campus. In fact, we launched this program in the Czech Republic on 2006 as one of the world's leading technology and manufacturing companies. Honeywell is committed to recruiting top talents and promoting science, technology, engineering and math education to Czech Republic. The program is also presented at university in China, India and Latin America. The program's goal is to cultivate and inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers and encourage them to see the possibility of a career in science and engineering. Since 2006, Honeywell has delivered a total of 42 science and engineering, er, uh, engineering events around the world. Here in the Czech Republic, in addition with Czech Technical University, we also bring the program to Vysoká škola Bajenská Technical University Ostrava and uh, Brno University of the Technology. Today around the world, Honeywell has about 22,000 technologists, 97 research and engineering facilities and 32,000 patents granted or pending. 
Honeywell recently celebrated 20 years in the Czech Republic and is represented in Prague, Brno and Olomouc with more than 4,000 employees in manufacturing, design and research, research services and uh, businesses organizations. Honeywell is based in Prague with approximately more than 700 employees from all over the world creates a unique multicultural environment and also us to support our customer in many languages. Our employees in Prague represent a wide scale of the functions in administrations, sales and businesses, development, procurement, customer support, finance and accounting engineering, legal communication, and human resource. The Czech Republic is also the cornerstone of Honeywell's global engineering strategy in Europe. The history starts from 1993 when Honeywell established the first lab in Prague, which was the first facility outside of the United States. And 10 days later, Honeywell established design center in Brno, which was 2006 integrated into the Honeywell Technology Solution, international network of research, development and engineering centers locate, located in China, India and the Czech Republic. Honeywell has also the manufacturing sites here in the Czech Republic. It's the two locality, one is in the Brno, when we are producing environment and combustion controls. And the second one is in Olomouc, where we are producing the static parts for the jet engine for the aircraft. Education in science and mathematics is one of the pillars of our corporate social responsibility effort. And we are dedicated to helping develop Czech Republic's future scientists and engineers. Of course, this wouldn't be possible without the support a commitment of our partner universities like your university, Czech Technical University. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to express our graduate to leadership of the Czech Technical University. And I would like thanks for their support and faith, which is helping organize this program. And uh, personally, I would like to thank Rector Konvalinka for his support to this partner partnership which allow us to organize this event. Thank you. And now, for the moment you have been all waiting for, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Wilson on the stage. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, I think we have to turn down the gain somewhere. Okay, that's getting better. So, uh, 50 and a half years ago, Arno Penzias and I made this measurement with the major pieces of a precision radiometer that we had just uh, put together. We'd been working on it for more than a year. Our plan was to use this to make a series of measurements with the Bell Labs 20-foot horn reflector. At the time, this record was a big disappointment because it showed that the, the noise coming out of the antenna was somewhat more than twice what we expected. Uh, we were hoping to understand the noise so that we could make uh, a series of measurements with it and uh, this was going to get in the way. In retrospect, this messy looking record is the first evidence we had for the cosmic background radiation. Um, something which has been very important in understanding the universe in which we live. In this talk, I'd like to discuss 
how we got to this point, how the source of excess noise was identified, uh, and then an important recent development uh, from the microwave background radiation. And then a few thoughts looking back over 50 years. I'd like to talk, start my uh, story in 1928 when Bell Laboratories hired two people of interest to this story. One was uh, Art Crawford, we'll talk about a little later. The other is Carl Jansky. Carl Jansky was, uh, and those two roomed together for a while, and Art Crawford ended up being my first department head. Um, <clears throat> Carl Jansky was tasked with understanding the noise on transatlantic radio telephone circuits. And he built this, uh, this antenna, which is, was able to rotate continuously and uh, monitored the noise coming in uh, for a long time. It was recorded on a pen recorder, I believe. So he saw several things, thunderstorms, man-made noise, and um, he also saw some hiss-like noise that came up once a day, uh, approximately the same time every day. And <clears throat> after investigating this for quite a while, he understood that this noise originated in the center of our galaxy, the center of the Milky Way galaxy in which we live. And thus, he started the science of radio astronomy. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, this actually received quite a bit of public publicity. Uh, Carl, however, said there's no indication of any kind that these signals represent uh, intelligent signals from, from somewhere else. This is just noise from the universe. So, <clears throat> uh, after a long time now, um, a fellow named John Pierce was at Bell Labs as a fairly high executive. He was a, um, a polymath interested in a lot of things. Uh, he, for instance, wrote uh, the, the book on electron beam guns. He contributed to communication theory. He started one of the first, if not the first, computer music uh, investigations. And he also wrote science fiction. And I think maybe that had something to do with his thinking about satellite communications and the possibility of having a repeater in orbit. So in 1955, he published a paper suggesting that that could be a very useful thing. In 1957, uh, the Russians launched Sputnik, and uh, then a couple of years later, later, NASA proposed to put up the Echo Balloon. The Echo Balloon was a 100-foot diameter um, Mylar balloon with uh, metallic coating. Uh, so Bell Labs proposed to use that as a first communication satellite. It wouldn't be really useful, but it would be a way of of learning how to do things, how to operate the Earth stations, and, um, uh, and how to track the satellite. <clears throat> uh, so they knew that this simple balloon, if you have a signal coming up, hits it, it's scattered in all directions, so the return signal would be very small. So they decided to use two Bell Labs inventions. Uh, one was a Ruby traveling wave maser amplifier, the world's lowest noise amplifier. And in order to not add too much noise to that, they would use a large horn reflector antenna that would, uh, would not pick up very much ground radiation. So they put that system together. Echo was launched. Uh, Eisenhower's voice was transmitted by Jet Propulsion Lab on the West Coast bounced off echo, picked up by the Homedell 20-foot uh, uh, horn reflector, and uh, sent out to radio stations around the world. This was the first uh, communication satellite application. 
Later, uh, Bell Labs produced the Telstar satellite, which was actually a useful active satellite. It had receivers regenerate the signal and retransmit it. Um, and it was actually, could be used for significant communications. So my background was that in 1957, uh, I went to Caltech to do a PhD without uh, a real idea of what I would do, what my thesis project might be. Uh, Sputnik, as I've said, was launched in the fall of 57, my first quarter at Caltech. And I don't think I realized how important that was going to be to me. Uh, it seemed like an important thing, but it really, uh, I think, changed my life. Um, <clears throat> in, the, uh, uh, in the next quarter, I needed to join some group to do research. And I joined a new radio astronomy group. It was really uh, a nice decision because they had finished the, uh, the large scale construction. They had built their antennas, uh, a way of moving them around to operate as an interferometer. And, um, <clears throat> and the, um, it was time to build receivers. Uh, as a kid, I had been very interested in electronics and the idea of building very sensitive receivers for a radio telescope and then using them to observe uh, really appealed to me very much. So I joined that group. And not having been an amateur astronomer, uh, I needed to learn some things about astronomy at that point. Uh, the, one uh, the one cosmology course I took was taught by Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the originators of the steady state theory. The idea that as the universe expands, um, that there's more matter created so that at all times the universe looks essentially the same as averaged over the whole universe. Uh, the density does not reduce as it expands, but stays the same. <clears throat> Philosophically, this seemed very nice because I didn't really like the idea of the universe beginning or even worse, the universe ending. And having a, an all-running universe seemed very nice. In my thesis, I used one of the two 90-foot antennas at Caltech to make a map of the Milky Way galaxy. This was originally sort of a fill-in project. <coughs> <coughs> now, you may not understand radio astronomy particularly. <coughs> you understand that optical astronomers make pictures of of stars and things in the sky. And um, radio astronomers do basically the same thing, except that when you have a large antenna, uh, typically, in those days anyway, there was one receiver. So the camera in your cell phone or in your other camera may have millions of pixels, whereas one of these radio telescopes has just one pixel. So to make a map, you have to scan it across the source. And, um, and it can not only pick up what you think you're looking at, but it can pick up radiation from the ground around it. So the technique I used was to point the antenna to the west of the Milky Way, let the Earth's rotation scan it across the Milky Way, and I had a a plot on a, um, on a chart recorder, which would go along. And as we went across the Milky Way, the received power went up. And then after we passed, it went back down. Later, I put this on a drafting table, put a um, meter stick under it, drew a baseline, measured things up above that. Um, <clears throat> this was good enough for the measurements I wanted to make but I knew it wasn't completely right because we're inside the Milky Way, no matter where we look, no matter how far off to the side, we're looking through some of the Milky Way. And uh, so I knew that I wasn't seeing the whole thing, but fortunately the Milky Way is very large in diameter and very thin. So uh, that actually was all right and I got my thesis done. 
So after finishing and uh, a one-year postdoc to finish up several other projects I had started at Caltech, I took a job at Bell Labs, knowing that I could use the 20-foot horn reflector there. Arno Penzias had been hired the year before. Uh, also, he did a radio astronomy thesis at Columbia University with Charles Towns, uh, the guy who uh, received a Nobel Prize for inventing the, the laser. Um, <clears throat> so why did Bell Labs hire two radio astronomers? Um, I'm sure that the reason they told upper management was that uh, they were interested in doing satellite communications. Radio astronomers use large antennas. They measure through the atmosphere. Um, they would know how to deal with the antennas, how to uh, make receivers, that we would be very useful in satellite communications. But I think there were two undercurrents that uh, may not have been spoken. One is that um, uh, Jansky's work had not been followed through properly at Bell Labs. And um, there was a feeling that they should have done more uh, after discovering radio astronomy, but they let that slip. And I think the reason for that was that it was the middle of the Depression. People were working on short hours. There was important work that had to be done, and so they concentrated on the the communications work that had to be done and let the uh, radio astronomy go by. The other thing is that Art Crawford had built the 20-foot horn reflector. Uh, other people at Bell Labs had made the maser and put the receivers together, and they were proud of what they had done. And they wanted to see it used for something besides just making one measurement with the ECHO satellite. Uh, and they thought that getting a couple of radio astronomers to, um, to help with that would be, <clears throat> uh, would be the, the way of putting it to good use. <clears throat> uh, the attraction to Arno and me, of course, was uh, the research atmosphere, good support at Bell Labs, and the opportunity to use the 20-foot horn reflector with an amplifier that was very low noise, so that even this little antenna would be sensitive enough to do significant astronomy with. Both Arno and I had used larger antennas for our theses, uh, but the 20-foot horn reflector had special properties. Here's a picture of some horn reflectors the way they were originally designed to be used. This is a communications tower, the so-called microwave relay where signals would start in one place, go about, uh, I don't know, 40 kilometers or something. There would be another tower. And so, let's see, does this show up on the screen? Yes. The signal might come in this way, uh, go into this antenna, go down into the uh, cabin at the bottom, be reconstructed, go back up and out this antenna. And one of the important things is that the, the design like that shields uh, one side from the other. So the strong signal going out on one side doesn't leak back in to the other side. So when a, um, so when a low noise antenna was needed, they turned it on its side so that it wouldn't pick up from the ground but could look up in the sky. So the signal would come in this way. This is a piece of a paraboloid, which focuses a plane wave oops, uh, down the horn into this cabin where our receiver was. <coughs> Another marvelous feature of this antenna is that this cabin does not move in, with respect to gravity. Um, I guess I'd better quit using the mouse. Uh, so we could have very heavy equipment in there. <coughs> the Maser had a, a, a magnet, which must have weighed the better part of a thousand pounds. And we had lots of big brass waveguide and other equipment in there. And we could be there with it. 
if you have one of these dish-shaped antennas in your receiver up here, you have to set things up, go make a measurement, and then get back to it. Whereas in this case, we could work with it very carefully and uh, interactively. Of course, the biggest feature is that um, uh, the, the horn part of this reflect, uh, uh, <clears throat> shields the receiver in here from the ground. So there is essentially no ground pickup, uh, less than a part in a thousand. So uh, uh, we tend to measure in astronomy, in radio astronomy, we measure intensities as uh, with thermodynamics. We speak of the t equivalent temperature because, in fact, we use um, we use loads, radiators at various temperatures to calibrate our system. So um, the Earth of course, is about 300 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, the pickup from this antenna you know, uh, is only less than about a tenth of a degree, uh, which would be small enough that we could really understand what was happening up in the sky. So Arno and I set, set out a series of measurements we wanted to make using the 20-foot horn reflector. <coughs> Among them, measure the absolute strength of a source uh, known as Cas A. Uh, this would be useful for both radio astronomy and satellite communications. Radio astronomers usually don't understand the full sensitivity of their antenna, so they are their system. So they will measure a standard source and the source they're interested in and take a ratio. We were going to provide the service of actually saying how bright the standard source is. For satellite communications, when people buy an Earth station, they want to know how sensitive it is. Well, they could look at Cas A, and we would tell them how bright it was because we were working in a satellite band. And uh, then they could tell whether the manufacturer had done the right thing, whether the product met specs or not. Uh, so this was a, a dual purpose project. Second thing, we would look for a halo of radiation around uh, our, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, when we got the 20-foot horn reflector, it was working at seven centimeters wavelength where we expected the halo to be very small. We, we would later build a 1.4 gigahertz, a 21 centimeter receiver uh, to measure the halo and also make a better search for hydrogen in clusters of galaxies. And <clears throat> in both of these cases, the first one, it would be fixing up my thesis, the, the thing that I thought was, was left uh, undone in mine. And Arno's thesis had been to uh, measure, find whether there was hydrogen in the space between galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So by starting with the existing four gigahertz system, we could do the useful measurement of Cas A, and we could do the control measurement for looking for the galactic halo. So we built the best measuring system we could do. Arno made a liquid helium cooled reference noise source with the emphasis on, uh, on being able to understand precisely how much noise was coming out of it. Uh, he solved the cryogenic problems pretty well, but the emphasis really was not on conserving helium, but on understanding what we had. <clears throat> I sort of put the rest of the system together, uh, a switch so we could switch between the, um, the antenna and the reference noise source, and um, made a stable measuring system. So as I've said, the, the initial measurement was a disappointment. Earlier at Bell Labs, before they built the 20-foot horn reflector, they had put together a small horn reflector with a Maser amplifier, and the whole system had been a little bit uh, noisier than they expected. So we weren't completely surprised, but now we had a direct comparison with the antenna, whereas they had simply been adding up all of the components of their system and found that the actual noise was a little bit more than what they added up. But they didn't have good enough um, accuracy, they didn't think they had good enough accuracy to say that there was actually any problem. 
So by the time we made this measurement, a fellow named Dave Hogg and I had accurately measured the gain of the 20-foot horn reflector for the Cass A measurement. And so we didn't want to disturb anything. So we spent about uh, nine months uh, understanding the calibration of our receivers so that we could make a proper measurement of, of Cass A. We calibrated in two or three ways. We wanted everything to be consistent so we really knew what was going on. During that time, we kept seeing the same excess three degrees Kelvin. Uh, the only time we would see something more is when we were pointing at some source we knew about. Uh, we kept looking for, uh, for some explanation of this, and we tried to think of everything we could that might be the problem. Uh, atmospheric radiation. Uh, radio astronomers at the time thought the atmosphere radiated about twice what we said it did. But we had one of the world's best instruments for measuring the atmosphere, and we were pretty sure that what we had was correct. And in fact, uh, the people who had made the bad measurement later realized they had applied a correction for refraction in the reverse direction. When they applied it in the right direction, they agreed with us. There was a possibility of man-made noise. Most radio astronomers go to a valley somewhere with hills around and no people so that there's no man-made radio noise. We were sitting on top of a hill designed for communication overlooking New York City. So we could point our antenna at New York City and see if we were picking up anything. And indeed, there was nothing very significant there. There were a pair of pigeons living in our antenna. We could calculate what an aluminum antenna ought to do, but if there are pigeon droppings in it, uh, that, that may be lossy, there may be radiation from the pigeon droppings. So one day after making the Cass A measurement, uh, we got up there and cleaned it out. The pigeons liked being in there because they could go up to the cab. In the winter, it was heated. In the summer, it was cooled. A very comfortable place for a pair of pigeons to live. The only problem was these two guys who came around about once a, a week and turned it around and you pointed it the other direction. They would fly away, and when we were tired and done, they would come back. So of course there were a lot of droppings in there, and we got up with our scrub brushes and cleaned it off. And uh, then we bought a have a heart trap, put it where the receiver was, and the pigeons dutifully went in even farther and got in the trap. Hooray, we get rid of the pigeons. We put them in a box, we shipped them in the company mail as far as we could away to Whippany, New Jersey, there was some pigeon fancier there we'd heard of. <laughs> so we sent them to him. Well, he looked at them and said, these are junk pigeons, and he let them go. Well, you might know, soon they're back. <laughs> so in the interest of science, our technician brought in his shotgun, and <laughs> that, was, that was the end of the pigeons. Now, we didn't actually put any pigeon blood on the antenna. But as far as I know, there have never been any more pigeons in that antenna. We also worried about imperfect walls. We put some aluminum, some very special tape over the joints. A couple of years before uh, celebrating my PhD, <clears throat> we had visited my wife's sister and uh, her husband in Hawaii. And at that time, the so-called starfish high-altitude nuclear blast had gone off. They had put a nuclear bomb up above the atmosphere and set it off, and it filled up the Van Allen belts. The, what we saw from Honolulu was that the sky just got very bright. We were inside a Quonset hut with some little rims around you could look out, and we, we very easily saw the flash when the thing went off. It went out, and the sky was all red, all of the interesting sort of colors you get in an aurora. <clears throat> so the Van Allen belts had a lot of charged part relativistic charged particles in it. We thought maybe that could be doing something. But over the course of a year, our signal didn't change, and we knew that the number of particles had gone down significantly. So we could rule that out. Uh, 
Um, likewise, everything else we could think of, uh, we could actually either measure something or rule it out. So we were really sort of getting to the end of our ropes. What are we going to do with this? We have no, we believe in physics. This noise has to come from somewhere. Come from the antenna, come from somewhere beyond the antenna, but it has to come from somewhere and we ought to be able to figure out what it is. However, we weren't. <clears throat> then one spring day in 1965, uh, uh, Arno called uh, <clears throat> a fellow named Bernard Burke, an astronomer who, uh, Arno liked to talk on the telephone. It was a good thing he worked for the telephone company. <clears throat> and Bernie also did. <clears throat> I've referred to Bernie as the internet of the 60s because he was someone who would call various astronomers and talk to people and sort of put things together. <clears throat> anyway, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Arno called Bernie about something. <clears throat> Neither of them remembers what the original subject was. But at the end of the conversation, Bernie said, oh, how's your crazy experiment doing? <clears throat> So why did he say that? That's because uh, sometime, maybe six months before, they had been together on an airplane going to a meeting in Canada. <clears throat> and Bernie had been quizzing Arno, what are the two of you going to be doing at Bell Labs? I think there was an undercurrent of, why aren't you at a proper research university? What are you going to do at Bell Laboratories? <clears throat> so Arno had given him the outline of the things we proposed to do. And Bernie's comment was, there's no halo around the galaxy, you're wasting your time. So anyway, Arno laid it on him. Uh, we've been trying to understand the excess noise in our antenna and no success, it stays there, um, we don't understand. So Bernie said, call up Bob Dickey at Princeton. So why did he say that? Bob Dickey was a well-known physicist who during the Second World War uh, put a lot of effort into the radar development. He had written one of the books about the technology developed during the Second World War uh, on uh, the technology for radar and receivers. And he had invented the kind of measuring system that most radio astronomers use, something called the Dickey radiometer. But <clears throat> after that, he had, um, he had become interested in gravity theory. Uh, he and another fellow invented the bronze Dickey gravity theory. And they were looking for <clears throat> some way that it was useful. <clears throat> it was actually an extension to general relativity. And as far as I know, the extension has never been seen to be useful. But anyway, he was interested in this. And as part of that, he thought about a Big Bang cosmology. What he liked was the idea of a Big Bang, an expansion, a recompression, a big crunch, and then another expansion. And he realized that after uh, a cycle or so, the Big Bang would be very hot. But as the universe expands from this, the radiation in the universe would cool off. And as a microwave person, he realized after it cooled off a lot, it would just be microwaves. You wouldn't be able to, if you have a hot oven, you ha hold your hand up near it, uh, you feel the infrared radiation from the oven. Well, this would be considerably colder than that. However, a sensitive microwave receiver should be able to, to detect it. So he did what people at universities do. He got himself two postdocs and a graduate student. And he was at Princeton, and he got two very good postdocs and a good graduate student. Um, uh, Jim Peebles, he set to making a calculation of what the current temperature ought to be. Use the best astronomical data he could get, uh, work through the physics of the expansion of a Big Bang, and estimate what they ought to see. Dave Wilkinson, he set to making a measuring system. Uh, well, it takes longer to make a measuring system than it does to do a calculation. And Jim Peebles 
finished up his calculation, had written up a preprint, preprint when he was invited to give a talk at Johns Hopkins. Now, postdocs are always looking toward their next job, so they don't think about deter turning down the, uh, the opportunity to give a talk at a good university. So um, <clears throat> Jim went to Dickey and Wilkinson and said, may I talk about the calculations I've made? And they said, sure, we're so far ahead, no one could catch up with us now. So he went off to Johns Hopkins, gave a colloquium, talked about the possibility of radiation left over from the Big Bang and the possibility of measuring it. Uh, his calculation actually was a little optimistic about how bright it would be. He had sort of a minimum of 10 Kelvin and uh, 20 Kelvin possible. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, he, he went and talked about that. A fellow named Ken Turner went to the, um, who was a friend of Bernie's, went to the talk went back to the office, told Bernie about it. The next day, Arno called. So Bernie knew that, uh, had heard the story about the possibility of radiation left over from the Big Bang. So Bob Dickey was uh, really quite a, uh, a well-known physicist and we were somewhat in awe of him. But anyway, we screwed up our courage, uh, called Dickey and um, Dave Wilkinson tells the story that they were in Dickey's office, the group of them, which is now called the Gravity Group, but anyway, the group that was going to make the microwave measurement and calculate, and the phone rang. So Dickey picked up the phone, and they heard uh, atmospheric radiation, antenna temperature, sky noise, uh, all the terms that they were dealing with. And they really pricked up their ears. What's going on here? So in a little bit, Dickie put the phone down and said, boys, we've been scooped. Uh, I think Bell Labs had a good enough reputation that he immediately believed that we had done what we said we had done. So we invited them over, and uh, the next week, I believe, they came over, told us about the cosmology, and we showed them our our equipment and what we had measured, and I think they immediately agreed that we had made the measurement that they would like to have made. Arno and I were happy to have any kind of an explanation for what was going on. We'd been worrying with this for nine months, and um, <clears throat> we're happy now. Uh, however, we were not particularly enthusiastic about the cosmology, because cosmology at that point, I think, had never really predicted and explained anything. So we thought there might be some other explanation. And I think the two groups were quite happy that we wrote a paper about the measurement, the Princeton group wrote a paper about the, the cosmology, and we published them back to back. We made one final check we took a transmitter around the top of Crawford Hill, aimed it at the antenna, and made sure that what we picked up was not significantly larger than what we expected. And indeed, it wasn't. And then on May, you may have noticed the original record was May 20th, 1964. On May 20th, 1965, by coincidence, two things of interest happened. One is that Walter Sullivan, the chief science reporter from the New York Times, at least in the physical sciences, called up and started asking questions about what we were doing. Uh, we happened to be up in the antenna. This was the Bell system. So up in that cabin, there was a telephone. There were telephones everywhere. So uh, uh, Arno talked to uh, Walter Sullivan and um, uh, he had asked some questions about what we were doing. It was obvious that he had heard something about it. It turns out he had a mole in the Astrophysical Journal office who had told him about uh, these two papers that were coming along. The editor of the Astrophysical Journal, a fellow named Chandra Sekhar, had taken it upon himself to, uh, to uh, review the papers him himself and approve them. So they were on a fast track to being published. The other thing that happened, only of significant to me and my family, is that my father came for a visit. I grew up in Texas, and he still lived in Houston, but he had some business on the other side of New Jersey, 
and he came, we had his two grandchildren, so he came to our house and spent the night. And the next morning, uh, I being a, only a couple of years out of graduate school, uh, still tended to run a little bit late. He was a businessman, he tended to run a little bit early. So he got up, showered, shaved, and got dressed, and we were just sort of beginning to stir. So he walked off a quarter of a mile to the pharmacy, the closest store nearby, and bought a New York Times. And he came back with it. And there on the front page of the New York Times was a story by Walter Sullivan about our discovery. It, it talks a lot about the Princeton explanation, the cosmology. That, of course, was a very satisfying thing for me, and I think for my father also. But I also got to thinking that, well, the world is taking this idea of a cosmological explanation seriously. Uh, I better start taking it seriously, too. <coughs> so the first confirmation came actually more quickly than we expected. Uh, it turned out the the first measurements of this had been made back in the, in the 40s. Um, there's a, a radical that's known in interstellar space, what I'll describe as CN. It's a carbon and a nitrogen atom stuck together. And uh, it can rotate as any molecule can do. And quantum mechanically, it has a lowest state and a first excited state and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, these were seen in the spectra of stars. So you have a star radiating light, a, a cloud with some CN in it, and the, the light is passing through the CN, and it absorbs some of the starlight at the frequency that would um, excite the CN to a higher level. And uh, they had noticed that it was excited, they saw two different optical lines, one excited from the ground state and one from the first excited state about uh, 2.3 degrees they measured above uh, the ground state. It was excited enough that it was in thermal equilibrium. Now they didn't understand the interstellar medium well enough to know whether that was significant or not. It could have been excited by collisions or by starlight. However, they did recognize that it uh, represented about 2.3 degrees, but the textbook of the time um, <clears throat> dismissed it as being of, of little significance. <clears throat> so, shortly after our papers came out, or maybe even before, the same Bernie Burke called up a fellow named George Field, um, who was in at Berkeley, and told him about our, our measurement and the temperature uh, of space. Now these CN uh, radicals, if they are isolated, can be thought of as a remote thermometer. You know, the excitation they get from the thermal radiation tells us the brightness of the thermal radiation. So it's a remote reading thermometer. George Field, uh, immediately knew what was happening because back when he was in Princeton, he had thought about the temperature of space, had remembered the CN measurements. He and Arno had even talked about the possible uh, temperature of space, although they hadn't talked about CN as such. And he had written up a little paper saying that uh, I don't really know the dipole moment of CN. I don't know how well it's um, that it is coupled to the radiation field, but uh, it looks like it ought to be a high dipole moment, it ought to be well coupled, and so this is measuring the temperature of space. He took it to Lyman Spitzer, the local interstellar medium expert at Princeton who said, I wouldn't stick my neck out that far. You don't know what the dipole moment is, you don't know whether this is a real measurement, so he put it away and lost it and went off to Berkeley. <clears throat> so when Bernie, <clears throat> Bernie called him, he was all primed <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to look at CN. Um, another coincidence, he reached down in his wastebasket and pulled up a paper. 
<clears throat> he had written a paper for a geophysical journal. He had asked the editor for a, an example of a paper that he might use, and the editor had sent him a paper about a comet tail. And at this point, he realized that there was evidence in that paper about the comet tail, which would allow him to estimate the dipole moment of CN. So he could pull it out of that paper and understand that CN really was making a measurement of the temperature. Not only that, a fellow named Hitchcock, a graduate student down the hall, was currently making measurements of CN in interstellar clouds. So the two of them made measurements in several clouds in our galaxy, and they got the same temperature for each cloud. That's a pretty good indication that this is something universal, not just the local conditions where they're measuring. <clears throat> Two other groups, a good friend named Pat Thaddeus and then a Russian named Shlovsky, remembered the CN and wrote papers also. By the end of the year, uh, Dave Wilkinson and Peter Roll, the graduate student, had made a measurement at three centimeters, uh, confirming our measurement. So about a year after our measurement. Uh, this was the state of measurements. Uh, this curve is a black body at 3 Kelvin. The distinctive feature is that it turns over at some point and drops off exponentially at high frequencies. Uh, that's how you would know it's a real black body. So <clears throat> our original measurement is here. By this time we had made another measurement at 21 centimeters. People other people had made measurements, but the CN was sort of an upper limit, and this CH, which is another similar case, is a lower limit. So there's no real indication at this point that it's properly turning over. <clears throat> so it could be something much hotter, but optically thin. Well, it turned out pretty soon that the theory also was not new. Uh, George Gamow and his associates in the mid to late 40s had been thinking about a Big Bang universe. And what they wanted to do was understand the creation of elements. They thought the universe started out as hydrogen, uh, but in the, uh, in the Big Bang, there could have been nuclear reactions and all of the heavy elements that we now know exist might have been made. Well, they glossed over some very inconvenient facts for nuclear physics, which basically says there are a few intermediate states missing and there's no way to get to heavy elements in something quick like the Big Bang. <clears throat> However, in 1949, Alfred and Herman, who were wor working with Gamow, wrote a paper suggesting that the current temperature of space might be about 5 Kelvin. Uh, that was based on the bad nuclear physics and uh, I don't know what numbers they got from astronomy, but they got remarkably close. Uh, a few years later, Alpha Fallon and Herman uh, made the first modern analysis of light element formation, but they didn't mention the radiation again, so they sort of let that drop. Alpha and Herman had asked about the possibility of making a measurement, but they were told that uh, it would be too difficult. As a kid, I had read a couple of uh, George Gamow's children's books. He wrote some rather interesting books explaining simple physics to kids in a story-like form, and I had read those books. Uh, the one of them I could find I went back and looked at, and I don't believe that he ever talked anything about uh, radiation in the Big Bang. Uh, in those. In any case, uh, I certainly didn't remember it at that point. So science doesn't always work in the, the way it's supposed to. You have a hypothesis, you go out and make a measurement and prove it's correct or not. There were five near misses in this case. The original CN, they didn't know enough about the conditions in the diffuse clouds to say it really was making a proper measurement. Gamow, Alpha, and Herman, I believe, could have made a measurement. The, the receiver that Dave Wilkinson put together at Princeton was not so different from what could have been put together with radar equipment after the Second World War. 
And um, our, our co-winner, uh, Peter Kapitza, had uh, developed a lot of cryogenics. Uh, they could have, it would have been expensive, but they could have bought liquid helium as a reference. A fellow named Ed Ohn at Bell Labs had used the 20-foot horn reflector, had built the receiver for ECHO. He had seen and documented in his uh, paper an extra 3.3 degrees in it. But he said, this, this could easily be just that I had to add up all the elements of my system. If I made a little, a little measure, measurement error here, a little there, it could be that far off. So he didn't pay much attention to it. George Field was really on the trail, but he was discouraged by an expert. In fact, if he had gone across campus a couple of hundred meters to the physics department and talked to Jim Peebles, you know, I might not be here today. Uh, a couple of Russians, Dorishkov and Novikov, wrote a small three-page paper on the local radiation density. Um, suggesting the importance of checking on the Gamow theory. Uh, Gamow was actually sort of a hero to the Russians. Um, they found Ed Ohm's paper, but they say that the, the translation was bad. In any case, they misinterpreted it, and they thought that everything came out all right, and therefore there was no excess radiation. So they also um, uh, didn't uh, didn't think anything was going on. I think we were quite lucky in this that, um, well, first of all, confirming observations came in soon, but there was very little pushback. Often when there's a change of paradigm in science, you have to wait for uh, a generation of scientists to die off before it will really be uh, accepted. In this case, I believe the steady state theory was dying for various reasons, and um, people were happy with the, um, with the Big Bang. Ho however, as time went on, there were, were two problems realized when people did really careful calculations. One is that for us to exist here, the density of the universe had to be exactly right at the beginning. Um, there's one picture I show sometimes that shows that at, I believe it's a nanosecond into the Big Bang, that is 10 to the minus 9 seconds, that if the density is wrong by one part in 10 to the 24th, if it's a little bit too high, the universe will expand for a little bit and then recollapse before we ever exist. If it's a little bit too low, it will expand so fast that stars and so forth never form. The other thing is that um, <clears throat> when we looked in different directions, we saw the same intensity. Whereas, if you look back in the Big Bang, when we look over there and over there, we're seeing radiation from parts of the universe which had never been in causal contact. There hadn't been time for photons or anything to travel from one part to the other. How did they get to be so exactly the same thing? So this was really a puzzle. Um, there was also the question of the, um, uh, whether this was really thermal radiation. That was solved with a COBE satellite. Uh, this beautiful uh, black body spectrum was taken by the COBE satellite, uh, published in 1990. The interesting thing about this graph is that if there are error bars on there showing the error, they're entirely within the, the line that you see. They had absolutely tiny errors. This was probably the most beautiful uh, black body measurement that's ever been made. And it confirms that the cosmic background radiation really had a thermal source and that it had to be at the very beginning of the, uh, of the universe. Well, in 1978, Alan Guth heard a talk by Dickey talking about the density problem. And he had the basic idea of a way that the universe might have gotten started that would solve that problem, uh, which he called cosmic inflation. 
He also heard about the uniformity problem from his colleagues and realized that cosmic inflation would solve that problem also. So in 1980, he proposed it. And a little later, Andre Linde and a few other people proposed uh, modifications that made the theory quite workable. The idea is, is that due to a, um, a state that we don't really know about of the, of the vacuum, uh, the universe could have been hung up in an excited state, and then it would have expanded exponentially. So a tiny piece of the universe would have expanded to be much larger than, our, uh, than the material that makes up our universe. The result of that is two things. One, it would be very uniform because the same conditions were expanded to fill up the whole universe. Uh, <clears throat> and it would automatically set the density to be the right thing. Um, inflation also invokes quantum fluctuations to say that the early universe wouldn't have been just completely uniform. The quantum fluctuations would show up uh, as differences in, uh, in density in various places. Um, so the general idea is we start off with inflation, which goes for a tiny fraction of a second, 60 e-folding times perhaps, uh, and then sets off what we think of as the Big Bang, which expands for 380,000 years. And at that point, the, uh, the hydrogen in the universe becomes neutral. Up till then, it's a big plasma, and um, uh, radiation cannot travel freely. So, um, but at that point, the, hydrogen, the universe cools off to the point that the hydrogen can become neutral, radiation is set free, and uh, we can make a map of what it looked like at that point because the radiation has traveled from then till now without a disturbance. Somewhat later, there are stars, galaxies, and now we have the present day universe and the structure which is evident at 380,000 years leads to the structure that we now see in the universe. If the universe had been completely uniform we wouldn't have stars and galaxies and things uh, and structure. So here's a baby picture of the universe made by the Planck satellite uh, showing the variations in intensity of the background radiation, which correspond to differences in density also. The red being uh, brighter, the blue being darker. Now there's a lot of structure in there and people do uh, <clears throat> what's called a multipole expansion. You ba basically measure the spectrum of the fluctuations. And that's the plot on the right side. And what's plotted there is the, um, is the uh, spectrum of this picture and the pictures made by several other instruments all strung together. And there's a line running through it which is a fit from what you expect from quantum fluctuations if inflation started the universe. So it's an absolutely remarkable fit between the data and the, um, and the prediction. But inflation also predicted a little more. Uh, it predicted that the background radiation would be somewhat polarized. Uh, there's a so-called E-mode polarization, which actually isn't very interesting. It doesn't provide much more information than the intensity fluctuations. But there's a B-mode, a very unusual looking mode of polarization, which is a unique prediction of cosmic inflation. It results from quantum gravity waves in, during inflation that expand with the universe, with inflation, and are leave their imprint on the cosmic background radiation. They are very weak, less than a part in a million of the cosmic background radiation, so very hard to measure. A group recently measured uh, B-mode polarization. Um, they announced it in, in March of this year. Um, and I believe that they, they really did measure B-mode polarization. 
However, now the Planck satellite people who measure uh, radiation from dust in our own galaxy say that the BICEP people underestimated the dust in the region they're looking at. And so it's possible that what they measured is just a local effect. This doesn't, at this point, it's sort of indeterminate what's happening. Uh, so it's an interesting ongoing story. Um, it may turn out that part of what they saw was local dust and part of it is the real thing. But we're going to have to wait for more measurements. Right now, the BICEP people and the Planck people have gotten together before they were sort of hanging on to their own data, hoping to each come up with the right result. But now they've gotten together to, to see how these two fit together, whether uh, the, the dust can explain what they're seeing. If it turns out it's there, it's going to be a very important result. Uh, first of all, it's a very strong confirmation of cosmic inflation. And it's the most direct evidence for gravity waves so far. And it will, it will probe energies, uh, I guess what I wrote was a trillion times those seen in the Large Hadron com uh, com uh, Collider. So might it, very much larger energies than we'll ever be able to produce on Earth. There are also several other experiments. So within a few years, we should have an answer in this. Here's a picture of the, uh, of the BICEP telescope. Actually, it's the shield around it. The telescope itself is only a little thing because it was looking at uh, widely spread radiation. It didn't have to be big. So these two guys in 1965 didn't have any idea how important the cosmic background radiation was going to be. Looking back on this, I feel very lucky. I feel lucky that I had a job at Bell Labs uh, where I was supported to apply technologies that Bell Labs developed to astronomy. Uh, there were many experts right there who had, in fact, developed much of the current microwave technology. And they were only too happy to help. Um, another thing I f feel lucky about is that I started my career when radio astronomy and cosmology were relatively new sciences. Uh, as I said, cosmology had not, had not done very much up till then, but co cosmology has really blossomed in, in the period in which I've been a professional astronomer. And it's been very satisfying to see that happen. As you may have gathered from the, the tenor of my talk, there really wasn't an aha moment. Uh, originally, we were trying to find our problem, then we realized there was a solution, but I don't think we realized how important it was. It was only as the theory developed and as uh, measurements got better that it got to the point where we get a picture of the universe at a very early time, and we can determine a whole page full of, uh, of constants of the universe uh, from this. So it was only slowly over time that it uh, was clear that it was important. However, it's very satisfying to look back and see that we did our job right and how much has come from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. Thank you very much for interesting and exciting lecture. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for your questions. So please, colleagues, wait for microphones, which will be traveling around if you have your questions, because we are recording uh, the talk. So please, your questions, comments. If there are none at this moment, I have microphone and I have questions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so you have you have, you have mentioned uh, the quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how far uh, do you think are we from the unification of theory of, of our known interactions? Um, I find it hard to tell. Einstein, of course, spent the last half of his life trying to do it. Uh, Richard Feynman worked on it. Other people have worked on it. So far, with no success. So it sounds like it's a very hard problem. And I don't know that we're a whole lot closer. I guess there's the possibility that string theory will come up with something if it ever predicts anything. But well, that's true that the string theory is a bit far from being able to be uh, somehow reproduced right. or, or the predictive power is uh, complicated. Okay, so of course this is a very uh, difficult question. I have one more, even yes. more difficult. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, was beyond or before the Big Bang? Oh, <clears throat> well, <laughs> beyond the Big Bang, <laughs> Uh, well, I think if you go to the current ideas of inflation, uh, especially if the BICEP2 measurements turn out to be really uh, correct for, um, for the parameters, um, <clears throat> that there probably is a multiverse. There may even be an infinite number of universes. That uh, I think the current thinking is that our universe originated in a quantum fluctuation, which then by inflation grew up to be much more than what we see. And of course we have no idea beyond the observable universe how much might be there. And it, it also may be infinite. Um, or there could be a boundary out there we don't see. So. Um, there are lots of uh, interesting possibilities, uh, most of which we will never be able to check on, I guess, because we can't see anything more than the universe we can see. But it's a stunning picture, picture really. Yes. To see that we are a small droplet which expanded internally into something very big for us. Yeah. Right. Very big for us. And maybe, you know, in one of these other infinite universes, there's another set of us talking to one another. Maybe at the same moment, <laughs> the same time is there. <laughs> well, uh, maybe one uh, personal question at this moment. When uh, w w you were a young boy, mm -hmm. were you interested in, in, let's say, radio engineering and in the building radios or, or radio techniques? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, my father... Um, <clears throat> had developed an interest in electronics and uh, fixed radios in their house. And I got very interested in this. And he remarkably let me uh, use his measuring instruments and work on radios. In those days, radios had hundreds of volts of power supply. They, in principle, could be lethal if you got yourself across the wrong place. But he let me work with it. And I got very interested and read a lot of things. And uh, I started, I learned a lot about, from a sort of silly magazine uh, aimed at people who fixed radios. And I read a series of articles in there on how you troubleshoot radios. And I think that had a big influence on my career. I've troubleshot a large number of radio telescopes and I think some of the same techniques I learned as a boy on how you, you find out what the basic problem is and fix it. Um, but during my high school years, I fixed people's radios and then when television appeared in the 50s, I, I started fixing television sets. And the nice thing, one of the nice things about that is when I finally had a course in electronics for physicists, I was really, I really, I didn't have a scientific background in it, but I had a real feeling for what happened in electron tubes. And that made it all very real. And I, I could really take it all in very well. Uh, it was uh, really a, a fun time to learn the mathematical basis of things I kind of knew intuitively. 
Now let's have a look to the audience, whether there are some questions at this moment. So please, there is a question. So our microphone specialists, where are they? Oh, Gilvi, please. Microphone. Yes, it's... it's Over there. It's uh, falling its way down. <coughs> In uh, one of your slide, uh, you have from inflation to present universe. Mm -hmm. But uh, the people working at CERN, they start from uh, quark gluon plasma and then to the present uh, universe. Uh, because if you go to slide, uh, where you are sure? Okay. This one no, or, or uh, this one? Uh, this one. Yes. Uh, you have started from inflation and then to present day. Yes. Inf but people start from coagulone plasma and then to present day because I can't understand this one even what is inflation here. Oh. <clears throat> well, inflation is the universe hung up in an excited state which for in physics that I don't understand, causes it to expand extremely rapidly. And it, it takes the quantum fluctuation and turns it into uh, the beginning of the Big Bang. The, so it is like quark glone plasma or different? Uh, yeah, the, this is all very much a plasma. plasma. The, in fact, uh, all the way up to the 380,000 years, it's a plasma. Um, Prior to the first minute or so, <clears throat> there's a, a sea of elementary particles. There's uh, annihilation and creation of new particles. It's all happening very rapidly and cooling very rapidly. Um, and I think that the, the science of uh, going from that state uh, at, say, uh, a millisecond or a microsecond with an extremely hot plasma cooling off to form the background radiation and then later uh, the, the structure of the universe we see now. I think it all fits physics very well. Inflation requires new physics that um, is probably correct, but we don't, we have no way of verifying. And the Quark gluon plasma or deconfined uh, nuclear matter was there up to the one microsecond after Big Bang, but much, much, much um, uh, longer times than Much longer than, time than yes. that, yes. Uh, uh, Steve Weinberg wrote, wrote a book called The First Three Minutes, and at the end of the three minutes, uh, the elementary particles have fixed. Uh, neutrons and protons have gotten together to form some heavy hydrogen, a little bit of lithium, but there's no more nuclear reaction after three minutes. So, please, the next question. This is a question that I was just inspired by <laughs> this picture. Uh, so, uh, as I understand it, uh, we see uh, the, the background all around us because uh, all around us was the plasma that was scattering uh, the, the, the background. Right. Why don't we see the plasma? Why we see only the scattered uh, background, not the plasma anymore? Oh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the, let's see, what we see is the radiation at the point where it quit being absorbed by the plasma. The photons were turned loose at that point and if you walk outside, some of them will hit you on the head uh, because they'd been traveling unimpeded. Prior to that, uh, they couldn't travel very far because of the plasma. So we can't get a picture earlier. Uh, we can just, uh, the matter from the plasma is what turns uh, out, is, which is what is making the stars and things and making us. That's the matter that was the plasma, but the only evidence of it we have is the radiation from it. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't get the answer. Uh, yeah, so maybe the, the answer is that the plasma, because, um, well, 
at certain point, uh, the plasma was the scatterer for the background. So the, 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 the plasma was, we can, we, can say, we can say the plasma yes. was like the source of the background as well from the optical well. point of view. So, so, so we should see the plasma as well as we see the background. Maybe the plasma is much, much, uh, much, much more uh, we, uh, weaker than the, than, than, the, than the background. Yes, before 380,000 years, the, the radiation was actually stronger than the plasma. Than the, okay. There was more energy in the radiation than in the plasma. And at about the same time that they decoupled, the, um, the radiation became less important than the, the matter. So, so if we measure more uh, sensitively, we should see the plasma? Well, how would you see the plasma? You see the plasma from the radiation that uh, uh, came from it. Yeah, like a UV radiation, or it's probably absorbed. Oh, <clears throat> yes. Well, at early stages, it, it was certainly UV, it was X-rays, it was very hard gamma rays. Yeah. But as the whole universe cooled, uh, effectively the, the wavelength of the radiation increased with the size of the universe. So those gamma rays became X-rays, became optical, became infrared, and all we have is the radio waves that's left now. But, but they're the same energy in photons, <clears throat> or the same photons basically, uh, are there. Okay, thank you. Now I, I got it. Thank you. Okay. So, next question, please. Yeah. There. Here. Let's come. Thank you. Okay, I, I have a question. Mm. <laughs> Is the cosmic background uh, changing in time? Yes, <clears throat> but very, very slowly. Um, if we go another, the universe is what, 13.8 billion years old. If we go another 13.8 billion years, it'll only be half as strong. Wow. So from our point of view, it's not changing. <laughs> yeah, so if we scan the, the sky, like the Planck satellite, it will be exactly the same the picture now and a year after. Yes. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, what I said probably isn't exactly correct because the expansion, the increase in the expansion rate will probably have some effect. But anyway, the, the cooling off is, <clears throat> the wavelength of the photons is growing with the scale of the universe, which is uh, only changing very, very slowly. Uh, I would like to know your opinion about, because you were mentioning the steady state theory mm -hmm. and uh, you said like you didn't like uh, uh, thinking about the end of universe. Mm -hmm. So currently there are a lot of discussions about how the universe will end. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know which of the theories uh, you found the most probable. Well, at, the, at this, let's see, I guess in the late 90s, it was discovered that the rate of expansion of the universe is actually increasing with time now. Originally, the gravity of the, of the matter in the universe was slowing the expansion down. But now there's something that's pushing it out. And <clears throat> that something is called dark energy. And we don't know much about it. But it, as, as best we can tell, it is causing an increase, and as the universe ages, the increase will increase. So the rate of expansion will grow, I don't know, quadratically or something. It'll, uh, it'll get more and more. So the view of the universe at this point is that the death will be with a whimper that um, <clears throat> there'll be more and more space between the galaxies. Um, someone pointed out that in a, in a long time, uh, one won't actually be able to see other galaxies very far away. 
and that cosmology may turn into something sort of like religion. That it's been known that uh, the universe went through all of this, but there's no way of measuring it anymore because you, can't, you just can't see the more distant objects. Thank you. But the, the general idea is it's going to run out of energy and uh, the density will get very small and it'll be a very un uninteresting place. So we are getting to the end of the time window for this lecture and we have a place just for the last question. I would like to ask a question which will be very interesting for all of us. I would like to ask you, Dr. Wilson, what are you working on right now or, oh. or what's your present act scientific activity? Um, I'm actually being more of an engineer than a scientist right now. Uh, I work at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, we have a, an array telescope we call the submillimeter array. It is eight six-meter diameter antennas. Uh, do you know the mountain Mauna Kea on the Big Island of Hawaii? This was up, is up at about 14,000 feet. <coughs> uh, the instrument is used to measure a lot of different things, but the main thing is looking at regions where new stars, new planetary systems form. And I'm currently working on uh, trying to greatly increase its sensitivity. Um, what has happened is that a new, much bigger instrument has been built in Chile, which has a better atmosphere also. They're going to put us out of business, but we're going to try to stay in business for a little while. So thank you very much. Yes, Once more, 